Hello, thank you for joining us at this week's Digital Debate Center. Today, we are going to be talking about the racism critique, which is in the middle school varsity section of the packet for answering the pandemic AF. So the structure of this is going to be a little different from previous DDCs that we've done, where we're kind of going to talk about the overview of what a critique looks like, and then we are going to look at uh, the one piece of evidence that is in the 1NC and also talk a little bit about something that's in the 2NC. So in general, critiques have three parts, which is a link, an impact, and an alternative. And we'll break down what each of those parts look like a little bit differently, but you'll notice that you know, unlike your disadvantages, there's no uniqueness here because this is a kind of a different kind of argument. So a critique is kind of like a combination between a disadvantage, but one that is not unique, and a counter plan, except instead of a policy option, they're going to have some non-policy idea for what we should do to solve the problem. And then there's also another kind of argument that typically gets introduced in debates with critiques, which is called framework, which we'll get into that, even though it's not going to be part of the 1NC, and you're not going to see it in the 1NC part of the packet for the racism critique specifically, it is an important part of debating critiques that you all should know. So, and you'll notice we call critiques Ks in debate, we spell them with the German way, not for any particular reason, it's just a weird debate thing that we do, but to jump into kind of what are these different parts? So if we think about a disadvantage, normally it is saying when we say that a disadvantage has uniqueness, we mean that like the plan is the one and only thing that is going to change the status quo for the worse. So everything will be fine unless we do the plan. Whereas with a critique, we are not claiming that the world is okay now unless we do the plan. We're saying that the world already has problems and the plan is just contributing to those problems. So it's not that the affirmative alone changes the world for the worse, but the affirmative is one of many problems that we have in the world that, you know, even though it's not the only one, we're still just like, well, it's bad. So it's like, even though this cat is has lots of knives pointing at it, even if we take away the F, we're like, well, it's not good that the F is also pointing a knife at this cat. So what does a critique link actually do? Like, what are they trying to do? The point of a critique link, instead of saying you change the status quo for the worse, is to point out the problematic assumptions or reasoning or logic that we have to believe for the 1AC to make sense. So if we think of the 1AC as a story, there's kind of like the 1AC is a story that the affirmative is trying to tell the judge for why there is some problem that needs to be addressed. And the way to do it is by voting affirmative, by doing some plan. But if you think about kind of what is a 1AC or a 1NC, it's like a bunch of evidence that we've put together to tell the story. But people don't just write things intentionally, like with the purpose of like, oh, someone will use this in debate and like make a 1AC out of it. The way we get to 1ACs is that we take different pieces of evidence, different sources from different contexts, and we kind of cobble together a story to sell the judge. So Critique Link kind of points out what is wrong with these stories. Because, you know, the 1AC, it doesn't necessarily make sense unless we, you know, assume or buy into, agree with certain things. So the critique is kind of expressing skepticism about whatever the story the affirmative is selling is. So, but you might be wondering like, okay, so there is a problematic assumption or there is something that, you know, we have to believe for the 1AC to make sense. Why does that matter? The impact part of a framework kind of gets into how whatever uh, ideology or logic reasoning that the affirmative participates in contributes to somehow causes something bad. So if we think about a disadvantage, usually we're like, oh, this one bad thing will happen if we do the plan. Instead, a critique impact doesn't just say, oh, this one bad thing will happen and then it's over. Like, oh, we have a war and that's bad. Or, oh, this other thing will happen and that's bad. It's more that there's a bunch of little ways, a bunch of different ways that an ideology affects the world. And by endorsing this ideology, promoting it, whatever you want to say about it, it contributes to all of those different things that, uh, all those different bad things in the world. And we'll get into when we talk about the specific racism, K. And uh, for those of you looking at our backlog, if you look at the militarism, K, kind of how there can be lots of different effects of one ideology. The last thing to talk about, which does not have a dedicated slide here, is just the alternative, which is like, if you remember a counter plan, uh, a counter plan says, hey, we have another idea. So instead of just doing whatever is in the status, instead of just doing nothing, sticking with the status quo or doing the plan, 
we could do something that is not the plan that is still better and helps kind of deal with the impact. So in this case of a critique, it is some idea for like, hey, here's something that we can do that would resolve the impacts. So kind of address whatever the problematic ideology is that the critique is talking about. So an alternative is usually unlike a counter plan, not an idea for like, hey, this organization should do this policy action. It's instead something like, oh, we should embrace a mindset shift. We should, you know, all agree to like think in a different way about the world. And that's how we deal with it. So the last thing to talk about that this one is not part of the 1NC uh, typically. You'll often see this when it does come up, it will be introduced after the 1NC, maybe by the 2AC and then the negative response uh, by introducing a framework in the negative block in the 2NC uh, is framework, which this one is really funky. This is something that you don't see a lot outside of critique debates. Uh, framework is a type of argument that tells the judge what they should care about, like how they should decide the round. What we normally do in debate, if you think about things like Mr. T and just plan versus disad type arguments, is that we're just looking at things in terms of like cost benefit analysis, kind of like, oh, are the consequences of doing the plan better or worse than the consequences of not doing the plan? And this is like just what we kind of assume by default, what the judge will be expecting. And you'll see in the 2AC part of the packet that the framework argument advocates for this usual cost benefit consequence based analysis versus what the negative does when they have a critique which is usually saying no 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 the judge should care about something else there's something more important than just uh weighing the hypothetical consequences of the plan versus the hypothetical consequences of not doing the plan or some other policy option like a counter plan so the negative will come in when they have a critique and say actually the judge should vote for whichever team does this the best because there's something more important than just you know having our hypothetical balancing of you know consequences versus other hypothetical consequences and we'll kind of get into what that looks like more specifically when we talk about uh, that piece of evidence but framework says instead of looking at you know the trolley problem just being like well it's easy did you kill one people or five people it says there's a different way that we should think about this it's not just a straightforward uh, numbers, who has the biggest consequence-based decision. So the specific 1NC evidence for this, you will notice there is only one piece of evidence for the 1NC shell. So if you're in your packet, you're going to see there is a piece of evidence from Deva Kumar in 2020, and that's it. That's all you get for the 1NC. This includes your link, your impact, and your alternative. So the piece of evidence overall kind of just talks about how systemic racism affects public health, uh, both like kind of like what policy decisions governments make based on public health, like whether or not to close borders because of a disease outbreak, uh, how it affects public health access. So it's like who's able to get to hospitals or doctors or get, you know, preventative care before things get really bad. Uh, are you able to afford it? Like how good is the care that you do receive if you do are able to get it? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and it pretty much says that, yes, yeah, systemic racism makes all of those things worse for people of color. So to jump into kind of like how we can look at the different parts of this piece of evidence uh, in terms of like what role they serve for making these arguments from the 1NC, there's, to start off, two kind of link arguments that we can think of if we look at this piece of evidence. The first one talks about how it's like pretty much the pandemic app literally acknowledges that there is systemic inequality right now. It says, okay, yes, people of color tend to have worse access to healthcare. They have worse health, worse health outcomes. They are more likely to get sick, blah, 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 all that stuff because of systemic racism. But then they don't do anything about that. And that's not good. It pretty much says that it talks about how talking about inequality in silos is bad. And what it means by that sentence is just like, okay, just like being like, here are the statistics, they suck. And then not doing anything to actually change what's causing that, which is systemic racism, is bad. And the second link argument that this piece of evidence can make is that when people are making public health decisions, so like when governments are making public health decisions, like whether or not to do the plan, or, you know, doctors and scientists are trying to like make decisions about like how to do things related to healthcare, and they don't think about race, and they just say, okay, here's our generic blanket solution that works for everybody, that allows systemic racism to continue unchallenged. So unless they are specifically thinking about when they make decisions, like, oh, how does systemic racism affect, uh, you know, who will have access 
who's going to get sick, all that kind of stuff, then it's not good. We'll still see the same problems where it's like the inequality will persist and we will never have like challenged uh, what's causing it in the first place. So to talk about the impact of like, okay, well, why do we care about, you know, not challenging racism? You know, why, why, why can't we just let it continue? For, so the impact part, the, there are two things that the evidence identifies uh, racism causing, which is just one, the worst overall health outcomes for people of color. This is pretty similar to the harms evidence in the 1AC where it talks about all the ways that, you know, people of color have worse health outcomes because of like lack of access, getting sick, all that kind of stuff, where it's just like, yeah, all that stuff still happens if we don't deal with racism itself. So kind of like the same stuff the app talks about, they're like, yeah, that will keep happening. And then the other thing is generational trauma. So the idea that the horrible things that happen to the people who are alive now will affect the, gen the people who have yet to come. So you are affected by, you know, the experiences that you've had, uh, both in terms of like, you know, how you interact with other people and, you know, how you make decisions. So every generation that is affected by racism on top of just being like, oh, it sucks that they are experiencing racism and that's bad in itself. Like all of the bad things that happen to them because of that will also affect you know, their children or their grandchildren and so on and so forth until we deal with it. So that's our impact. And finally, what the racism critique alternative is, is for us to advocate for dismantling racism at like the highest possible level. So every time we say systemic racism, don't just be like, we dealt with this like one instance of racism, or we dealt with this one thing caused by racism, or, you know, something like that. It's like, we need to like, look at like the whole like shebang of like racism and, you know, why it's here, why it affects so many things at so many levels and deal with that in order to actually effectively have good public health policy. And it says that if we don't have this good public health, if we don't deal with racism itself, we'll never be able to have effective public health policy that actually can help people of color consistently. So it's like, we need to explicitly reckon with race. We need to be like, tear down racism. And also like when we are making decisions about like healthcare, whether that be the governments or the doctors, whoever making decisions about healthcare, race is something that should be considered instead of, you know, using those kind of race neutral policies that are just like, this will work for everyone. So to kind of summarize what this one piece of evidence or the one, NC, the one NC as a whole is saying about the one AC, it's saying that the one AC has identified like this one manifestation, this one example of systemic racism through, through pandemics. They look at the disproportionate impact of pandemics on people of color and say, we will deal with that by just dealing with the pandemics. But that ignores everything else that affects people of color because of systemic racism. That affects, so the things that are on this slide only get into like things that the 1NC Deva Kumar evidence talks about as like other things that people of color have to deal with in terms of healthcare because of racism. So those are things like, you know, the barriers to accessing healthcare, just being sicker overall, being more likely to get sick, and then, you know, governments using outbreaks to justify closing borders saying like, oh no, we, we can't let these people from this country in because then, you know, they'll get us sick. All that stuff, not dealing with it. And then the 1AC goes and they've dealt with only the pandemics and not every other fire burning in the background and just say, we did it. We solved, we, we solved for racial justice. This is our impact. We did it. All right. Pat us on the back, judge, give us that vote and says, no, that's not good. So to finish up kind of talking about what to think about with the racism K when you're the negative, uh, your framework for this is going to be not that the judge should just vote for whoever has the biggest impact, the biggest consequences, but to vote for the team that best promotes racial justice. And of course, if you're negative, you're going to be saying we are doing that and not the affirmative because of everything in your Deva Kumar evidence. So what this is saying is that if the negative wins that their framework is the best one, that means that the judge is not voted, that when the judge signs the ballot and says this team won, they should be writing down whichever team best promoted racial justice versus all the other usual considerations you would have with like Mr. T, which the two AC will be advocating for. So there's not an explicit piece of evidence for this in the one NC, but if you look in the two NC part, there is evidence from Ndumbe EO in 2020 that talks about how specifically it gets kind of back into what the alternative talks about, about how 
not considering race and how it affects things at a broader level in a lot of little ways allows racism to continue. And that that is why we should actively work to prioritize conversations about race, incorporating considerations about it into decision making, things like that. So this piece of evidence kind of gets into like, why is it good for us to actively promote and work on and think about race versus just, you know, being aware that it exists and doing neutral actions. So that's the one NC side of things or the negative side of things. I'm going to hand things off to Manny to talk about the AF side of things. All right. I am going to be talking over the answers to the racism critique for the pandemic affirmative. Um, I will also be doing a, at the beginning, a sort of review of what the general types of answers you can make uh, against a critique are. And then I'll be going into, again, the specific uh, pieces of evidence um, to answer the racism critique in the packet. Okay. So, I think generally you can um, think about answering the critique. Most answers fall into three different categories. The first category um, is framework. And I think this is the category that is most specific to critiques because most other debates don't usually get into framework. So framework is essentially right how the judge should evaluate the plan, the affirmative, the debate as a whole. And that uh, the, the way that sort of gets articulated is here's our interpretation, right? The judge should use, I don't know, consequentialism, right? That the judge should primarily think about what are the consequences of any given action? What are the consequences of not doing that? Which set of consequences is better or worse, both for one set of consequences over another? Um, the negative can introduce an alternative framework, but generally the affirmative sort of wants to stick to that consequentialist policy focused mindset. And again, the sort of way that it's uh, argued in debate is that usually it'll include like an interpretation, violation, and standards and voters. I, I would focus especially on standards and voters because those are reasons why the judge should prefer your framework interpretation over the other teams. And that's not just for the affirmative side, but also for the negative whenever they're going for a as well. So the second category sorry, of answers to critiques or criticisms are what I call counterplan answers. And what I mean by counterplan answers um, is that these are types of answers that you can also make against counterplans because one part of the critique is the alternative, which in some ways is kind of similar to a counterplan because it's a alternative course of action to the, to the plan, even if it's not another policy option that's different from the plan. Um, so in this category, I think there are four big types of arguments. One, permutations, which are essentially arguments about how the plan and the alternative uh, can happen at the same time, that they don't have to, like, they are not mutually exclusive. The second is offense, which is just that the alternative causes something bad to happen. Um, the third is theory, um, which mostly just means uh, arguments about status. If you've ever heard the term conditionality, that's where this comes from. Theory arguments are just arguments why certain debate arguments are bad for debate. And by that, I mean they certain arguments may be unfair to debate about, certain arguments may be make the make the activity of debate less educational than otherwise would be those sorts of arguments not necessarily about the actual substance of the arguments but not the necessarily the substance of the critique but explaining the critique's effects um, as a debate argument um, and then the fourth type of counterplan answer is um, solvency deficits which is a little different um, between the K and the counterpoint. So what I mean by that is when you, somebody says, some, when people are talking about solvency deficits, uh, when they're talking about counterplan, they usually mean there are some reason or set of reasons why the counterplan cannot solve 
the impacts or the scenarios of the affirmative. That's also true um, of uh, K debates, right? That affirmatives should uh, maybe make arguments about why the alternative wouldn't solve the all the impacts or scenarios of the 1AC. But the alternative can't solve can also mean the alternative can't solve its own links or impacts. Because if we think of the K as a sort of counter plan with its own sort of internal net benefit, right? If the K can't solve its internal net benefit, um, that that also poses a problem for the K being able to win the debate. So those are the four types of counter plan answers. Um, and then the third category is disat answers. And similar to counter plan answers, what I mean by this is since the K has similar structural parts uh, to a disad, right? The link and the impact, you can also talk about answering the link and answering the impact as if they were answering a disadvantage link or a disadvantage impact. So that will take the form of either no link or a link turn, right? That the plan either doesn't cause the link or in fact prevents the link from happening. Uh, and there were no, and then no impact and an impact turn. Either the impact is not that bad or that the impact is actually good. And then sort of the third kind of argument I would put here is case turns the DA or in this or in this context, case turns to the critique, which is essentially should be arguments that are like explaining why the AFS impacts happening make it, makes it impossible to solve or prevent the impacts of the K or of the criticism. <clears throat> now, um, we're going to get into the specific pieces of 2AC evidence that are in the packet for the racism critique. So the first piece of evidence is the heard in 2017 uh, evidence, and this is your piece of framework uh, uh, evidence. So heard is essentially saying that policy analysis um, in the context of public health is actually very useful because it allows for targeted problem solving, right? We can say that there are these individual problems that we can take specific actions to solve and that that doesn't necessarily prevent a focus on broader social issues, right? That policy analysis can be both useful and can lead to broader discussions and furthering the public debate about a particular set of issues. The second piece of evidence is the Hall et al. in 2016. Um, just as a minor note, et al. is usually, uh, I believe, a shortened version of a Latin phrase that essentially means multiple authors. Whenever you see a piece of evidence that says et al., that means it's usually more than three authors. So the evidence will just list one author et al. so that you don't have to for example, read all 20 scientists who have sci who have participated in a particular scientific study because that would take a really long time. Um, so the Hall et al. evidence, or just the Hall evidence for short, um, is essentially saying is your permutation to both uh, piece of evidence, and by that, and permutation to both just means the all of the plan and all of the alternative can happen both in the same world, that they can happen, we can pursue both and not have to worry about them contradicting each other. So Hall says that public health policy can be effective when it is done with health equity in mind. It also uses the term, the terms downstream and upstream. Downstream are sort of more, person, or more personal or individual level actions that are likely to exacerbate or to worsen health inequity or health inequality as opposed to upstream or uh, more policy focused actions like the plan. The third piece of evidence is another et al, um, Berkowitz et al in 20. Um, and this I believe is the no link in turn piece of evidence uh, to answer the racism critique. This is saying that public health uh, focus is actually good at improving health, is actually good at improving health equity, that policy focus is the best way to resolve the impacts 
of the critique. It also says that uh, COVID offers a, a variety of lessons that can be used in the future of public health and public policy analysis that can help resolve the issues of health equity um, that both sides acknowledge exist in the status quo. Um, and then the third thing I wanna emphasize is that it says that policy failures are also disproportionate in their impact. And that's an important argument because as the affirmative, you can use that to say, well, policy, public policy will still exist even without the plan and public policy may not work without the plan because the plan makes you know, public health policy better because it increases our preparedness against pandemics, which that leads us into our fourth and last piece of evidence, um, Amnesty International in 2020. So this piece of evidence um, is your case turns the critique evidence. And this says pandemics and disease outbreaks exacerbate discrimination. And it lists some examples about COVID, especially showing how violent and how targeted policing and policy can be to respond to, to pandemics. Now, if you're reading this, you might be thinking the one and C evidence um, against the critique also mentions this, that um, public health policy can actually be uh, pretty violent or pretty targeted towards uh, certain uh, communities, right? The reason that this is an affirmative argument, I think, is because it's saying that without the affirmative's increase of pandemic preparedness, um, future disease outbreaks will happen. And because those disease outbreaks will happen and become pandemics, that means that uh, there is more and not less likelihood of the case impacts happening in a world without the plan. So yeah, that was my uh, lecture about answering about answering the racism critique against the pandemic uh, against the pandemic staff.